and kneels on the burglar's right. The ice cap spearing straight into the ocean. Sea fog. It had to happen. It can blot out everything in a few minutes. If they haven't already got a compass bearing, they're in trouble. They could spend days lost in this, cutting their way through the tight ice. Suddenly, Earl's kite had caught the edge of a crumbling ice floe. The water is below zero. <laughs> so many Inuit kayak hunters have silently perished in these waters, dead in minutes in this frozen waste. We all were rather proud of ourselves learning to roll kayaks and having a photograph taken of us all rolling in formation. And uh, Gino said, uh, yes, you know, it's all very well to roll a kayak when you intend to roll it. But you know, I often wonder if you are forcibly rolled by the weather or what have you, uh, whether you could remain calm enough to get the right way up again. Well, it was prophetic because he, his kayak slipped off an ice floe into the water and he decided to retrieve it. But of course the water was too cold for him. And that's how he died. Oh well, I thought this is a this is a, a great loss. It's a great loss to us all personally, but it's a great loss to to everybody to, that a young man with such promise and so much accomplished already and ahead of him uh, should be no longer with us, cut off as it were in his prime. Well, we weren't quite sure we were going to get across. We had no idea. It was just um, push out and see how far you can get before you stop. And uh, if you are stopped, well, you turn around and go back, providing, of course, that um, the ice doesn't close in behind you, in which case you're pretty well stuck there. Um, we could have camped on one of the old ice floes, maybe, but we just sort of really had to clasp fate in our hands and see just how far we could push off. <laughs> As it turned out, it, um, it led us through. It is now September the 20th, two weeks into the journey, and the kayaks have only covered 200 kilometres. They only just beat the freeze at Kogue Butte and are still fighting its ice 50 kilometres further south. Winter is closing fast, too fast. Here at Umavik, swirling currents clog the coast with sea ice. It's a maze of moving leads, open one minute and quietly closing again the next. High on the ice cap, great plumes of spindrift were rising, a pittery. In the race to reach safety, the teams split up as they followed different leads to shore. Separated by mountains, 
Each team dug in for the storm, not knowing if the others were still alive. How you mean? Oh, good. Very nice, yeah. Interesting the way the group ended up in two pieces. Um, you know, <clears throat> the decision that Larry and, and I came to, which everyone came to for a start, which was go for it. And in my mind, there was only one place to go, that was for the nearest land, with what you could see on the ice cap and the direction the wind was coming from. I would never have gone up the way that Earl and George did, even with a gun pointing at my head. There's no way you would have got me to go up into the bay with the ice I could see up there. As it turns out, they got through well. But, you know, it's a personal thing. I back 100% going straight for land as we did, and we were damn lucky we didn't get caught. The ice closed in, you could be 20, 30 miles out to sea. Emotional stress was added to existing physical hardships. We were heading directly into the, uh, the channel up here to meet the boat as agreed, so we continued on in that particular route. We watched you guys head for an easier lead, taking it further down the coast, and we stuck to the, uh, to the channel. And anyway, we got caught in the, the pack, just the very edge of the pack as the wind hit, and uh, we managed to get through that and in between the gusts and, and so on, we were able to duck amongst the bergs and get into the, uh, into the channel just up here. Mm. And then we fought our way around the northern side of the channel and into where we expected the boat would be. After drifting 500 miles in an open boat, caught in the pack ice, Norwegian explorer Nansen landed here in 1888 to attempt crossing the ice cap. And in 1829, Danish naval lieutenant Gar forced a route past here in our fruitless attempt to discover a mass leak. It was no place to linger. The jokes were few and far between. Ready? Bring it back. Oh, oh, he got it. He got it. Skippy, oh, skip, skippy. Look, I spent eight weeks building this boat. I don't want you to stuff it in five seconds without careful. Our thoughts turned to a calm anchorage and a quiet wait for the kayakers in the tiny hunting village of Skoland. Meeting the 25 people there will be a welcome break from our own company. Artuit was a hunter, like his father and his father's father. And like the men before him, he must have courage and persistence if his family is to survive the winter. Life is very tough in this land, and when winter signals its merciless approach, all the creatures here call on an inner tenacity forged over centuries in the Arctic. Husky's brute force is the lifeblood of their survival, especially on the long winter sledging trips. We've waited through 11 days of bad weather. The kayakers are a week late and may have run out of food. We head back north to look for them. A local hunter, Thomas Cocho, brings a message that they are safe. They shared his hut and food for three days during a pitterack. Our worries dissolved in a flurry of jokes. So hungry. <laughs> oh, we realised we were lucky to see them again after hearing their incredible stories of survival. Got smashed up by a bird. 
He was upside down. He feel his concussion from all this ice crumbling around. It was just hanging everything. Uh, upside down. Yeah, and I could see ice building up around. I thought this is dead. And I could be 80 foot under ice cubes. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't know how far under I was. And when I finally got out, I didn't even have an urge to get out. I just thought this is, this is it. And I did. I feel his ice there. Go, oh no. This is it. Yeah, mate. It was so close. What are you doing so close to it? We had no choice. It was just Berg City there. Should we come aboard, you think? Well, it's up to you guys whether you want to come aboard or paddle around or whatever um, you want to do. Right. We'll hop out here and there's no big deal where we get out. Here on the island they named Desolation. Hurricane force winds and giant seas destroyed most of their gear, reducing them to starvation rations for almost a week. They only just escaped through huge freezing seas. You know, these bergs are like time bombs to me after this. For me, it's like going through a minefield. You don't know when one's going to go off. You don't know what's going to happen. It suddenly seems very dangerous. And luckily for me, it was a bomb that only went off in a little way. <laughs> it just sort of didn't go off. It was a dud. <laughs> um, there was George upside down too. He's swimming. His kayak split on the back. I, these kayaks are carbon Kevlar. Uh, they're very strong. You know, it's just absolutely nothing to a berg, of course. <laughs> and it's shattered to pieces whenever it wants. And, we got out of that by the skin of our, yeah, by our teeth. Thank you. We were all Thank grateful you. for Thomas Cocho's kindness. Sure. And tonight we can celebrate Australians and Greenlanders, bonded by the kinship of survival. too far at all, is it? Dreadful weather. Has anyone got any, any Christmas cake? <laughs> Earl was now facing an important decision. As I scraped last night's snow from the deck, I wondered if those kites would stay put for the rest of the journey. Go! We made the yacht ready for sea and said farewell to our friends in Skolan. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much for everything. Yeah. I hope you didn't take good shape. Thanks, mate. Have you have good honey. Sit down, mate. Take care of yourself. Another day. Arthur and his father left for another day's stalking. The hunting more urgent now with the shorter days and deepening winter snow.
We knew it was late when we left uh, Maslik. All the other expeditions were on their way home as we headed south. I think we've got this far by the skin of our teeth and winter's clearly on us. And uh, Mother Nature has made the choice for us. We've completed the ice section and the rest is just big water paddling. We've now got to go via the boat straight down to Prince Christian Sound and jump this rocky coast and we can continue the journey on the west coast from Prince Christian Sound. Earl's decision emphasised Arthur's earlier warning. I want to say one thing to the kayakers. This is not Australia or South America or Africa. This is East Greenland. It is now winter and you must be careful. Must be careful. At five in the morning, on the day we shall have sailed into the safety of Prince Christian Sound, we were hit by a furious storm. The anchor dragged and we were forced out to sea. At 10 a.m., the wind is the strongest any of us have ever experienced. By late afternoon, Eleanor has been slammed by 50-foot seas. The wind is howling at 280 kilometres an hour and snowing heavily. The only safe place is below deck. At dusk, we are capsized. Skipper Tony Axford hit the coach house roof and suffered serious injuries to his back. With no power or steering, we spent the most terrifying night of our lives. The next day, we radioed for assistance to get Tony into hospital. Johanna Christina, Johanna Christina, on arrival on channel 16, over. Johanna Christina. We shall be about half the, five and a half knots from you now. Five and a half miles from you now. And, uh, uh, are you, uh, are you, uh, are you, uh, you got your motor on, on the sail? Uh, you got your sail up? Uh, that's a negative. Uh, our sail was um, blown away at this stage. We'll have a, um, some red handheld flares burning on deck. Over. Okay, yeah. And uh, are you uh, sailing uh, through course of uh, Cape Horn? To west and to uh, Prince Christian Sound? Negative. Um, we are without a runner and we're without power at this present stage and we're lining uh, a hull to the window. Oh, yes, you were just out now. Uh, about, about the air. Uh, you got your motor up, you got your motor up. Negative. We've got no uh, motor power, we have no sail power, and we have no rudder. Over. Well, uh, you are not right there. Uh, negative. Uh, our radar was, um, we got uh, knocked over last night and the boat filled up with water and the radar was swamped along with HF radio, over. That's okay. About uh, and a half an hour, about and a half an hour. By a miracle, Johanna Christina, the last supply ship bound for the west coast, came to our assistance. Tony laid up, I was responsible for our stricken yacht. The seas were still mountainous and there was a serious threat of collision until the tow rope was secured. Many ships have been capsized and sunk in these terrible waters. In six hours, we were towed to safety. The permanence of these mountains and serenity of Prince Christian Sound 
contrasts sharply with the uncertainties and tempest of our last night at sea. Greenland is a world of frightening contrasts to humble the boldest of explorers. We had come through. Earl had driven hard and the strain now shows. Beneath his obvious relief, the odyssey is almost over. Yulian Hub, our destination at last. Tony has moved to hospital for x-rays on his back, surveying the damage to equipment, we're thankful it isn't worse. Now comes the long job of cleaning up and preparing Eleanor for her long winter storage in Greenland. Nearby lies ancient Brathild, where Eric the Red ended his life's journey. A quiet but powerful setting for Earl and I to reflect on our adventure. I think under the circumstances um, that were pretty bloody trying in my experience. Yeah, so we find ourselves towards the end, eh? Tommy, um, in your opinion, do you reckon the aims of this expedition have been sort of fulfilled in any way? Uh, <laughs> well, the thing is, it, you start out with an expedition idea, um, but because you're going into such remote places under such difficult conditions, uh, you may never even get to start the expedition you set out on, and you may be thrust headlong into a totally different expedition by sheer dint of circumstance, like Shackleton, who was going to cross Antarctica, never even got to see the place, but had an incredible journey. Um, I suppose it was um, uh, really, it was about kayaking down the coast of Greenland. In addition to that, it was sailing, uh, it was traveling, it was exploring one's own little version of Greenland, sh um, sharing in the, the rediscovery of, uh, of Watkins, and feeling, a, a developing a, a bond with the explorers of yesterday and, and continuing the tradition. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, there's been, there's, we've had a few problems. Um, as a rule on expedition books, you never, you never get to, to read the true story of an expedition. And in fact, a large percent, percentage of expeditions have enormous personality problems. Um, because you've, you've got a lot of very strong ind individual, uh, highly motivated um, blokes brought together and they all want to get something special out of that expedition. <clears throat> and it's well nigh impossible in many cases, or all the time, to harness those various forces. And uh, I mean, Eric Shipton wrote many, many years ago and caused a hell of a uh, furor when he wrote that um, you could be so impassioned to, to want to drive your ice axe through the skull of your tent mate after long enough, uh -huh. simply because you don't like the way he holds his cup of coffee. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. it's a very intense experience, if you'll pardon the pun. And that brings out, momentarily, the worst of people. I think good expedition members, good men, good, good people generally, uh, are able to, should be, um, should be able to, to forgive one another their excesses. And of what value was this journey, or any other? It is as well for those who ask such a question that there are others who feel the answer and never need to ask. Others like Gino Watkins and Eric the Red, who probe the limits of themselves in this wild place called Greenland. <laughs> 